This is the understanding and responding to my body, my choice session. And Emily Albrecht is going to be the speaker. Emily is a speaker, writer, and coach with Equal Rights Institute. She is the former co-president of Oles for Life at St. Olaf College, where she worked to transform campus culture using ERI's apologetics to foster respectful and productive dialogues about abortion. At ERI, she is using her educational background to write, develop curriculum, and teach pro-life advocates how to change minds, save lives, and promote a culture of life in their communities. Emily is particularly passionate about reaching the youth of the pro-life movement. As a recent college student, she understands what it feels like to walk unprepared into a culture that is overwhelmingly pro-choice. Emily is also on the board of directors for Cradle of Hope, an organization that provides financial and material assistance to families and pregnant women. Please help me welcome Emily. Thank you all so much for having me. It is a pleasure. And thank you to the many shared faces from this morning. It's so exciting to see that I didn't scare people off. <laughs> so I am really young, in case you hadn't noticed. I'm fresh out of college. And so I get asked the question a lot. What do you do for a living? Right, I'm at the hair salon, and the stylist says to me, what do you do for a living? And I spent months hating that question because I work for a national pro-life organization. And many of you who probably do pro-life work are also familiar with this problem. Like I talk about abortion all day, every day. And so the question is, how do I answer the question, what do you do for a living, in a way that's gonna start this conversation off on the right foot if she's pro-choice? Because I'm more than happy to go talk about abortion. Like that is what I do, but I want this conversation to go well. And so how do I answer the question, what do I do for a living, in a way that's gonna start this off well? And Here's what I finally settled on. If someone says to me, what do you do for a living? I say, well, I help pro-life people to be less weird. <laughs> Every single time. Even those of you that heard that joke this morning still laughed. <laughs> okay, they always do that. They look at me with this kind of weird sideways face and they chuckle to themselves and they're like, what does that mean? And I say, well, I help pro-life people to make more good arguments and fewer bad ones. And I help pro-life people to just connect relationally with people on the other side so that we can actually engage with their ideas. I get that it's a really strange job, okay? But I think it is so needed in our society today because in case you haven't noticed, we are horribly bad at actually engaging with people on the other side. It's been quite frankly depressing to me to just watch how polarized our society has become. Like abortion has always been a difficult topic to talk about. It's emotionally complicated. I think it's ethically and philosophically complicated, which we're gonna talk a lot about in my session right now. But these days, it seems like we can't have a conversation about anything. <laughs> like, I'm really aware that there are no good examples in the media of adults who can actually engage with someone on the other side respectfully and productively. I think it's a problem on all of the sides of politics. Okay, there are people on the right that are engaging in really bad behavior where they make you feel like people on the left are dumb. And I don't think that's true. I, I'm gonna offend some people right now, I'm so sorry, that's kind of inevitable. But Ben Shapiro destroys pro-abort. It's basically a meme now, okay? You will never see Equal Rights Institute release an Emily Albrecht destroys video because I don't think it is helpful to listen to other people who make you think the other side is dumb, bad, or the enemy. There's plenty of people on the left that do this too. Okay, just turn on MSNBC. It is there. <laughs> but I get particularly peeved when I see people on the right who are engaging in this negative behavior because I consider myself on the right. And so I want to fix this because I think it's hurting our side. I don't think you should be listening to people who make you think the other side is dumb, bad, or the enemy. Because guess what? If I'm talking to a pro-choice person, I'm very pro-life. I work for a national pro-life organization. This is my every day. But if I talk to someone who is pro-choice, I don't think they're dumb. I think they have really good arguments for their position. I ultimately think they're flawed arguments, and I hope I can show them why. But I don't think they're dumb, and I definitely don't think they're my enemy. And if I did, 
that would not help me to change their mind. I think it is bad for your soul to think that other people are dumb, bad, or your enemy. I also think it's pragmatically not helpful. I don't think it's helping you to actually change anyone's minds or change any culture. I think we need less hate and more dialogue in our society. And I'm basically trying to encourage that in the pro-life movement. I think we need more dialogue among friends and less debate among strangers on Twitter. Amen. Thank you. I think there is also a catastrophe about how polarized our society has become, because that means that we don't actually understand people on the other side. In other words, I think there is an epic catastrophe, especially in the pro-life movement, that we never go talk to pro-choice people, like real pro-choice people today. We don't know what's driving their view. And I think the average pro-life person is really equipped to talk about the arguments that pro-choice people were using like in the 80s, and not the arguments that pro-choice people are using today. It's important that we can actually dialogue with the other side because we're never going to change anyone's mind if we don't know what's driving the pro-choice views today. And today's pro-choice views are about bodily rights arguments. There's two primary camps that pro-choice people will fall into. The camp that I talked about this morning, the idea of personhood arguments, what is the personhood of the unborn? And then the even more common one than that, this camp. The idea that abortion is fine because of the rights that people have to their own bodies. A few months ago, I was doing a speech very much like this one, except not actually on this topic. And afterwards, this very sweet elderly lady came up to me, and she said, could you give me a smart pro-choice argument? And I said, sure, I, I think there's a lot of smart pro-choice arguments. Okay, so I, I put my pro-choice Emily hat on, and I said, well, I think that women should just be able to decide what to do with their own bodies. And she looked at me and she was like, oh, well, that's super easy. I totally agree with you. Women should have the right to do what they want with their bodies, but the unborn's body is not your body. And I said, no, yeah, I, I understand that. What I'm saying is that pregnancy just involves a woman's body very intimately. And so I don't think that women should be forced to use their body to sustain someone else that's trying to like feed off of them. And she was like, that's a horrible way to think about the unborn. Okay, the unborn are not parasites, they are human. So let me explain. The unborn has human DNA, it's a unique human being from the moment of conception, and like the unborn are not parasites. And also how dependent you are on someone does not make you less of a person. And I said, I know that! That is not what I'm saying. I believe the unborn are human. They're biologically human, they're philosophically a person. I am on the same page, okay? What I am saying is that we shouldn't be forcing people to use their bodies to support other people. Like, if you were dying of kidney failure, I don't think the government should legally require me to donate my kidney to you. Maybe I'm a bad person if I don't, but like, there should not be a law saying I have to donate my kidney to you. And so why are you trying to force women to donate their bodies during pregnancy? She had no response to that. And so I took my pro-choice Emily hat off, and I quickly explained to her bodily rights arguments and how to actually respond to them. It is a catastrophe in the pro-life movement that pro-life people do not understand how to respond to that pro-choice argument, because that, my friends, is what pro-choice students today are saying. Here's the really interesting thing to me about that story that happened to me. I did not intend to get upset. <laughs> Okay, this is a really sweet elderly lady that was like genuinely trying to understand and asked a really honest question. Can you give me a smart pro-choice argument? And I started out just like being a nice pro-choice Emily because I put on my role play hat, which I do all the time. My job at ERI is training pro-life people. And so I put on this pro-choice Emily hat to role play with pro-lifers all the time to give them practice, like using some of the arguments that I teach. And I also know a lot of pro-choice people because I've been doing this for long enough that I've talked to thousands of pro-choice people like, I can play a pretty good pro-choice person. And so I put on my pro-choice Emily hat, and I got kind of method acty. Like, I started feeling pro-choice. I started using the arguments I've heard people use, and I was getting really frustrated because I was trying very hard to explain my position, and she was insisting that I was saying something stupid. She was insisting that I was just ignorant about biology, and that's not what I was saying at all. I was saying that I know the unborn are human, but abortion is still fine. And she was like, no, 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 you don't think the unborn are human. And I was like, no, I'm, I understand, okay? It was extremely frustrating. And that is what I wanna fix. I wanna make it so pro-life people never 
make a pro-choice person feel the way that I felt in that conversation when I was pretending to be pro-choice. I wanna make sure that I never make a pro-choice person feel like that. Essentially what happens is a pro-choice person says one of these key phrases. They say, it's part of her body, it's inside her body, it's dependent on her body, my body, my choice, women should have bodily autonomy, a fetus is like a parasite using women's resources, the government shouldn't control women's bodies. The pro-choice person says one of those things and the pro-life person strawmans them. Strawmanning is when you basically respond to the stupidest possible version of what someone is saying rather than their actual argument. The technical definition of straw manning is if you intentionally misrepresent someone's proposition because it's easier to refute than what they're actually saying. I don't think that when straw manning happens in conversations about abortion, either side, whether a pro-life person is straw manning a pro-choice person or a pro-choice person is straw manning a pro-life person, I don't think it's usually intentional. I think usually what happens is that we genuinely don't understand what that person is saying. And so we end up responding to the stupidest possible version of what they said rather than what they actually said, because we didn't take the time to really understand them, and they were also being kind of vague. The more I've worked with pro-life and pro-choice people, I think they like speak different languages. They don't understand each other very well. Like, pro-choice person says X, and pro-life person hears Y. Or pro-life person says A, and pro-choice person hears B. It's kind of like our brains do this Google Translate thing. Okay, have you ever watched one of those YouTube videos where somebody takes the lyrics to a famous song like Let It Go, and then they translate it from English to French and French to Spanish and Spanish to Mandarin Chinese and then back to English, and then somebody sings the song, and it's absolutely hilarious because Google Translate gets it wrong. We all know this. I think that's exactly what happens in our brains. When a pro-choice person says one of those key phrases, it goes in our head. We think we understand them, and we really do not. And we end up responding to a really stupid version of what they're saying. That's how I felt in that conversation. And I want to make sure that no pro-choice person ever feels that way ever again. Because pro-choice people are actually making smarter arguments than you think they are, 99% of the time. Now. Before I launch into how I actually respond to bodily autonomy arguments, I want to make it very clear that if you're someone in this room who has been that elderly lady before, a purchase person has said to you, my body, my choice, and you have responded with, but it's not your body, I am in the same boat as you. Okay, I am not standing here on some like moral high ground trying to impart my wisdom on you because I'm such a better pro-lifer than you. Okay, that's not what's happening at all. I have also made really bad pro arguments before that I didn't realize were bad for like years. And so I learned from my mistakes. I learned from having really bad conversations that didn't go well with pro-choice people and trying to understand why my argument wasn't convincing and why they were getting frustrated. Like I, I tried to do a lot of introspection, as is my whole team at ERI. Having thousands of conversations with pro-choice people, we have all made these mistakes. I have a whole speech called Eight Faulty Pro-Life Arguments and Tactics. Every single one of those eight arguments that I dump on in that speech is something I have done. Okay, so what I am hoping is that you can learn from the mistakes I made and hopefully not make them yourself. I am not any better than you. I have made this mistake before. So anytime today that I hear a pro-choice person say one of those key phrases, it's part of her body, it's inside her body, whatever, whatever, the very first thing that I'm always going to do is respond with a clarification question. I'm going to say, I want to understand your view, but it sounds like you might mean one of two different things. Do you mean that the fetus is not a human being because it's like a functional part of the woman's body, like her kidney or something? Or... Do you mean that it doesn't matter if the unborn are human because women should have the right to do what they want with their bodies? I have asked that clarification question in thousands of conversations about abortion. Do you want to know how many people said this? How many people said, yeah, no, I'm, I'm talking about like the unborn is, is literally a part of the woman's body. Like two, not percent, like total <laughs> of the thousands of conversations I had. No one thinks this. If someone actually is this, if they are genuinely confused about the biology of the unborn, I am more than happy to go talk about that. That's something that most pro-life people are already pretty well equipped to talk about. We know how to talk about the fact that it has unique DNA and it's a human organism from the moment of fertilization and all that jazz. You know what to do with that. And if you don't, I'm happy to answer it during Q&A. But that's not where most pro-choice people are at. They all say this. 
they all say it doesn't really matter if the unborn is human. Yeah, I, I believe it's human, at least for the sake of argument. It's, it's definitely biologically human. We'll say it's, a, it's philosophically a person, sure. What really matters is that it's inside of the woman's body. That is the argument that they're making. So I will always ask that clarification question. There are two basic types of bodily autonomy arguments, and we're gonna talk about them one at a time. The first one is the sovereign zone view. What the sovereign zone view says is that like a woman's body is her sovereign zone. She has the right to do anything she wants with anything inside her body because her body is her body and her body alone. And so the sovereign zone view says that because the fetus is inside the woman's body, it doesn't matter if the unborn is a person. What matters is that it's inside her body. And since it's inside her body, the rules change because you have the right to do anything you want with anything inside your body. Of the two kinds of bodily autonomy arguments, this is the weaker of the two. Like if it was my job to advise pro-choice people how to make better arguments for abortion, this is not the argument I would tell them to use. Okay? Because this argument proves too much. Way too much. Ultimately, it's the weaker of the two bodily rights arguments because it is very clear that you cannot do anything you want with anything inside your body. So usually what happens, if I'm talking to a pro-choice person and they say something that sounds like the sovereign zone view, women should just be able to do whatever they want with their bodies, I will start out by pointing basically out to them what the logical ramifications are of their view. What the world would really look like if the sovereign zone position was true. And spoiler alert, they're not gonna wanna live in that world. There's four main implications of this view. The first one is that there can be no restrictions on abortion at all. Now this is a view that statistically we know 75% of pro-choice people don't agree with. 75% of pro-choice people, according to a 2019 PBS NewsHour Marist poll, say that there should be restrictions on when during pregnancy abortion is allowed. So some people put the cutoff at like six months, some people put the cutoff earlier than that, some people put the cutoff all the way at like six weeks. These are all just pro-choice people we're talking about, okay? They put cutoffs all, sort, all over the place. Most pro-choice people think that at a certain point, abortion shouldn't be available anymore. Even more than that, think that abortion shouldn't be available for just any reason that you want. They think, well, you shouldn't be able to have an abortion for sex selection, you know, to choose the gender of the child. Or you shouldn't be able to have an abortion as birth control. I hear that a lot. Not really sure what that means. I always have to ask them a clarification question. But there's a lot of different views about when abortion should be available. But 75% of pro-choice people think there's at least some time or some circumstance in which you shouldn't be able to have an abortion. And so I will always point out to them that that view is inherently contradictory. <laughs> Like, if they've told me, well, I think women should have the right to do anything they want with their body, the first thing I do is I ask them a clarification question saying, you know, I want to understand you and different pro-choice people think different things about this, so do you think there should be any restrictions on abortion? Like, do you think it should only be available for the first six months, the first three months? Like, I'll, I'll just throw out a couple different options, and they'll usually tell me, well, I'm really uncomfortable with, you know, late-term abortion. I don't think people should be able to have abortions then. And then I'll say, I don't mean to make fun of you. Like, I, I really don't. I'm just trying to understand you. And it sounded to me like you're saying something that's contradictory, and I'm sure you didn't mean to do that. So help me understand. You said that it's really important that women can do anything they want with their bodies. But then you said you're okay with restricting women's bodies for certain kinds of abortions. So why are you trying to control women's bodies? <laughs> and inevitably, they're like, oh, well, I, I didn't realize that I was doing that. Okay, I need to be consistent. And they'll usually drop the whole category of broadly autonomy arguments, and they'll jump to like, well, earlier in pregnancy, it's not a person, and later in pregnancy, it becomes a person, which is the topic we talked about this morning, for those of you that were here. And so, usually, that is enough to dislodge them from the sovereign zone position very quickly, because most purchase people don't actually think that we should have abortion available at all times. Because as long as the fetus is inside the woman's body, the sovereign zone position would have to be true. If the sovereign zone position is true, it applies to all times that the fetus is inside the woman's body. And most purchase people don't actually agree with that position. If they do, however, there's another step that I'll go. And let's say they're willing to say, all right, fair enough. All abortions have to be fine. I'm, I'm willing to live in that world. I'll move us on to step two, because there's another implication of this view. And that is thalidomide. So thalidomide is a really tragic part of medical history. Back in the 1950s, there was this medicine named thalidomide that doctors were prescribing for morning sickness. 
It was a really, really effective medicine at eliminating morning sickness. But they found out too late that it was also causing severe birth defects. It was causing babies to be born without arms and legs or with severely deformed arms and legs. So there's a real thing that happened over about a five-year period. There were 10,000 babies that were born with severe birth defects as a result of their mother taking thalidomide. Out of respect for the fact that this is a real thing, I am going to put up on the screen an image of a baby who was born after his mother had taken thalidomide. It'll be on the screen for about five seconds, and I'll let you know when it's gone. So if you don't want to see it, you should look away now. All right, it's gone. I think it's really obvious why the medical community had to pull that from the shelves. And we're all glad that they did. You can actually get thalidomide today for other things, but they like test you to make sure you're not pregnant and all of that. Like it can be used to treat other things, but you are not allowed to take it if you're pregnant. And we can see why. But if the sovereign zone position is true, if you can do anything you want with anything inside your body, then we can't stop pregnant individuals from taking thalidomide. If there was hypothetically a woman who was experiencing really severe morning sickness and she wanted to take thalidomide, we cannot tell her no. Because the fetus is inside the woman's body. If it's true that you can do anything you want with anything inside your body, taking thalidomide has to be fine. I have never talked to a pro-choice person that was okay with that, ever. Sometimes I do get to this step. They're willing to say there should be no restrictions on abortion at all. And so I go to this step and I talk about thalidomide. I have never talked to a pro-choice person that says thalidomide is okay. But if hypothetically they did, there's a third level I can go to. Thalidomide to intentionally deform your fetus. I am not saying that this is what women are like. I am not saying that there are any women who would actually do this. But we're in philosophy land, so if you can imagine it, it goes. And we could hypothetically imagine there being a person who was pregnant and wanted to take thalidomide, but not because of morning sickness. They wanted to intentionally deform their child. I don't know why. Maybe they wanted a tax break. Maybe they had a child that had a disability already, and they didn't want to have like a perfect child afterwards. This is a very messed up person we're imagining. Okay, extremely messed up. I am not saying any women are actually like this or would actually do this. But hypothetically, if there was a woman who went to her doctor and said, I want to take thalidomide to intentionally deform my child, if the sovereign zone view is true, we cannot say that is wrong. Clearly, there are some things that you cannot do with your own body. Like, that alone should be reason enough to reject the entire sovereign zone position. The fact that that is an implication. I've never had to go this far, but hypothetically, if the sovereign zone position is true, then you can do absolutely anything to an unborn child, including having it tortured to death. I'm not saying this is what women are like, or that there are any women who actually do this. Hypothetically, we could imagine someone who, for some very messed up reason, wanted to hire a doctor to actually torture that unborn child, like daily, for the entirety of pregnancy, and then finally kill it like the day before it was going to be born. We can't say that's wrong. If the sovereign zone position is true, if you can do anything you want with anything inside your body, then that has to be okay. The sovereign zone position is ultimately a very weak argument because it proves way too much. And so that's why pro-choice people usually, very quickly, will jump to the smarter kind of bodily right argument, which is the right to refuse. So the right to refuse position is essentially the idea that people can't do anything they want with anything inside their body. That, that's way too much. But people minimally have the right to refuse the use of their body to someone else who is trying to use it. The most famous version of the right to refuse is this violinist thought experiment in a paper by Judith Jarvis Thompson. It came out in the 80s, and it completely changed the abortion debate. But it's really only gotten popular now. Like today, it's being taught in basically every philosophy 101 class on a college campus. So when I go do outreach at college campuses, I am hearing the violinist all the time. It's a thought experiment that goes like this. Imagine that you wake up tomorrow in a hospital bed, and you have no idea how you got there. 
scary, right? And so you look up and you notice that there's a tube coming out of your side and connecting you into the side of this mysterious man that's lying in a bed next to you. Suddenly the doctor comes running into the room and says, oh my goodness, I'm so glad you're awake. Let me explain what happened. You were kidnapped by the Society of Music Lovers. And this man in the bed next to you is a world famous violinist. And he is dying of this very rare kidney disease that requires him to be connected to someone else's kidney for nine months. So the Society of Music Lovers obviously wanted to save his life, and so they figured out somehow that you were the perfect match for the violinist. So they kidnapped you, and they brought you here, and they connected you to him, and all of that is terribly unjust. I am so sorry, but here's the problem. He's a person with an equal right to life, just like you, and if you unplug from him, he will die. Judith Dervis Thompson invites us all to agree that obviously you have the legal right to unplug from that violinist. Maybe you're a bad person, but it shouldn't be against the law for you to unplug from the violinist. And therefore, says Thompson, abortion has to be fine because you should have the right to unplug from this other person. See, she's agreeing that the fetus is a person. You should have the right to unplug from this other person that is trying to use your body. If you're pro-life and you've never heard that argument before, I just want you to take a second to realize how powerful that is. The first time I heard the violinist, I was like, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> I might have to become pro-choice now. Like, I, I am open-minded about my views. I talked about that this morning. And that means that I'm dedicated to following the truth where it leads. And I was like, that is such a smart argument. I'm gonna have to seriously think about this, and if it turns out that that's right, I'm gonna have to become pro-choice. It was my freshman year of college when I heard that argument, and I was completely dumbfounded. I didn't know what to do with it. Before I go respond to that argument, respond to the violinist, it's really important that I talk about moral culpability. Because in order to actually respond to what the smartest pro-choice philosophers are saying, I'm gonna have to go into a level of detail about what abortion is. And I wanna make it very clear that I do not think of women who have had abortions like someone who would kill their toddler or something. I think in order to have full culpability for an action, you have to fully know what you are doing. In other words, law is really focused on mens rea, which is like having your mind on the thing that you're doing and the thing that you're doing on your mind. And so if we had the kind of knowledge about abortion on like a widespread scale that would justify having full moral culpability for having an abortion, we would not still be debating abortion. Because <laughs> everyone would just know that this was a human person and it's wrong to kill human persons and it would be done. But we don't have that kind of clarity in society. And so I don't think it makes sense to hold an entire society on a whole in full culpability for abortion. There can, however, be different levels of moral culpability on an individual level. Like, say, for example, that I was charged with demolishing an old warehouse with some explosives. Like, I was going to hit a button and explosives were going to go off and this warehouse would be demolished. And let's say that, unbeknownst to me, I thought the building was empty, but you went back in to get your car keys that you had forgotten. And I pushed the button. You're going to die. And that's absolutely tragic. And it is my fault to some extent. Like, I should have triple checked that a building was empty before blowing it up. But I genuinely thought no one was in there. Like, I was confident everyone had left for the day and I didn't know you went back in. That is very different from a scenario in which I waited for you to go back in to push the button. Okay, in that case, not only did I know you were in the building, but killing you was my goal. That was the whole point. Let's bring this closer to home with two hypothetical abortions. Let's say that there's a 14-year-old who's brought to Planned Parenthood by her grandmother. She doesn't know what happens in pregnancy or that a human is killed in an abortion. And she could go do research on her own, but she doesn't feel like she needs to because she trusts her grandmother. And the people at Planned Parenthood certainly are not going to tell her otherwise. I don't think that she should have full moral culpability for having an abortion in the same way that I think I should if I had an abortion. Like, I have a very, very, like, intense knowledge of what happens in abortion and the nature of the unborn. And I make a living advocating against abortion because of the kind of knowledge I have about it. 
I think if I had an abortion, I should be held fully morally culpable. Okay, back to the violinist. So, we have this hospital. You're in it, you're connected to the violinist, right? And if you unplug, they're, they're gonna die. And so therefore, abortion must be fine. Tracking with me? So there's a couple different ways that we respond to the violinist thought experiment. And the first ones are rather unpersuasive, if I'm being totally honest. So let me tell you about some of those first. The organ use objection. In other words, I've heard pro-life people say, well, your kidney was not designed to sustain a violinist. Okay, so the violinist has no right to your kidney, but your uterus, haha, that was designed to support a baby. That's like the whole point. That's why God created it that way. And so the baby, the fetus, has a right to your uterus in a way that this violinist does not have a right to your kidney. If you are talking to a pro-choice Christian, you go for it. But most of the people that I talk to don't believe in that narrative that you and I were created with some purpose and like every part of our body was created for a specific thing. So I've not found the organ use objection to be very persuasive to basically anyone. Here's another one, parent versus stranger. In other words, it says that you have different kinds of obligations to your own child. And so this violinist is a complete stranger. You have no obligation to help him in the same way that you would to your own child. And so, like, because you have created this child, like, it is, has partially your DNA, it came from you, all those kinds of things, like, you have different obligations to it, and so you need to help your child, or you don't need to help a stranger. I think that is true to some extent. I do think that you have different obligations to your own children than you do to random strangers, but a thoughtful pro-choice person is just going to change the thought experiment on you. So a thoughtful pro-choice person will say, okay, well, let's say the doctor comes running in the room and he says all of those things, he explains what happens, and then he says, by the way, we ran a DNA test on you while you were asleep because we were trying to figure out why you were the perfect match for the violinist. And guess what? The violinist is your long-lost son. Congratulations! Now can you unplug? I still think you can unplug. I think you're a worse person if you unplug, if that's your own child. But I don't think that the government should legally require parents to donate their kidneys to their children. And so I don't think that the parent versus stranger objection actually solves the abortion issue. I don't think that that answers the question. Let's move on to some more persuasive responses now. The responsibility objection. That says that when you engage in consensual sex, you are engaging in an act which you know might result in the creation of an inherently needy child. And therefore, you owe that child some sort of compensation. I often like to explain this with a little bit of an analogy. So imagine that we have a Coke machine. Like it's this giant machine, it's not literally a Coke machine, but it looks like a Coke machine. There's this big button in the middle, and when you push that button, you get a pleasurable experience. And then sometimes, a newborn baby pops out of the chute at the bottom. <laughs> Are you tracking with me? <laughs> We've like super simplified pregnancy. Okay, we could even imagine that there's multiple buttons on this machine that each correspond to different kinds of birth control. And so different buttons have like a different percent chance that a baby would pop out of the chute and maybe you get a lesser or a pleasurable experience. Like we, we could imagine this, right? So let's say that there's a man who really wants that pleasurable experience but he does not want a newborn to come out of the chute. So he goes up to the machine and he picks whichever button corresponds to the level of risk he's willing to take and how much of a pleasurable experience he wants. He's basically rolling the dice. He pushes the button and lo and behold, it is not his lucky day and a newborn baby pops out of the chute at the bottom. It seems obvious that he cannot just abandon that newborn there to die. Why? He pushed the button, right? Like he willingly engaged in an action which he knew might result in the creation of an inherently needy child. And so I think he minimally owes that child some sort of compensation. He cannot kill it. I think he minimally has to provide that child with food and shelter until someone else can. Like he could either take that child and care for it himself all the way up until age 18, and then it would be an adult and he wouldn't have to like technically have any more legal obligation to it. Or he could simply minimally provide that child with food and shelter until he can hand off that care to someone else. 
Like imagine safe haven laws. Every single state has one of those where you can take a newborn and drop it off at any police station, fire station, or hospital. I don't want any woman to feel like she has to be in a situation where she would need to use that. But I'm glad we have that law. I think a similar thing applies here. Like I think he just minimally has to take care of that child with food and shelter until he can hand him over to the police and say, I can't take care of this child anymore. Done. Just, you just can't kill it. That's really all I'm saying. The responsibility objection is extremely powerful because when you have sex, you are engaging in an action which you know might result in the creation of an inherently needy child. And so I think you minimally have to take care of that child until someone else can, which perhaps unfortunately is for nine months. Like, I would love it if we had the ability to just Star Trek beam the fetus out of the mother's womb into an artificial womb when she wouldn't have to be pregnant anymore and the fetus wouldn't die. Like, there might be some other ethical concerns there, but if we had that technology, that would be awesome, and I would love to figure it out. <laughs> but we don't. And so I think you are obligated to take care of the child until someone else can, because you pushed the button. You engaged in that action, which you knew might result in the creation of an inherently needy child. The responsibility objection is so powerful that Michael Tooley, who's one of the most famous portraits philosophers alive, in a debate one time, he admitted that he never uses bodily rights arguments. He never uses any of these arguments we're talking about because the responsibility objection crushes the violinist. Because in the violinist, you did not willingly engage in an action which you knew might result in the crea in creation of this inherently needy violinist. You had nothing to do with it. But that's not the case in sex. However, this does not cover all cases of pregnancy or all cases of abortion, okay? If you're looking carefully, it says, when you have consensual sex, when you willingly engage in an action, which you know might result in the creation of an inherently needy child. So what about cases where it's not consensual? We're gonna need a different argument for that. That brings us to the right to refuse in the case of rape. Do you have the right to refuse the use of your body to someone else who's trying to use it when you did not willingly create that person? There's two main ways that we respond to this. The first one is called the obligation to help approach. Basically what this approach says is that you don't always have an obligation to help people, but in certain circumstances you do. And pregnancy ought to be considered one of those circumstances. So let's say that you're a really good swimmer and you're swimming laps at your local pool and there's no lifeguard around, there's no one else there, it's just you. And as you're getting out of the pool, you notice this toddler come running in and fall into the deep end of the pool. It does not seem like a stretch to ask you to jump in and save that child. I think that there are some circumstances when you are the only person in the immediate vicinity who's capable of caring for an inherently needy child, you have an obligation to. You have an obligation to help. It's kind of like in the Pixar movie Up. If you have not seen the Pixar movie Up, what is wrong with you? <laughs> like seriously, you need to fix that problem. All right, I will only spoil like the first five minutes, so please go watch it. In the Pixar movie Up, we have this old man named Carl and his house is about to be taken over by the government via eminent domain. And so Carl does what any logical person would do in this situation, right? He ties thousands and thousands of balloons onto his house and attempts to fly it to South America. Just go with me, it's a cartoon. Okay, so as he's lifted his house off of the ground, he hears a knock at the door, which is very strange considering that he is in the middle of the air right now. So he opens the door and he sees Russell on his porch. Russell is this boy scout that he met earlier in the movie. And Russell looks absolutely terrified, understandably, and he asks a pretty reasonable question. Can I please come inside? <laughs> and Carl says, mm, no, and he slams the door. Then there's this very comedic pause, and of course Carl opens the door and lets Russell inside, and then Russell proceeds to drive him absolutely crazy for the rest of the movie. Go watch it. Let's imagine, however, that Pixar had decided to take that movie in a much darker direction. What if Carl had said to Russell, well, you know, this is my house, and I have the right to refuse the use of my house to someone else who's trying to use it, so I'm gonna kick you off the porch. 
If the house had landed a few minutes later and the police would have driven up and they'd have said, Mr. Fredrickson, when, when you lifted off the ground, there was a witness that said there was a little boy on your porch. Where is that little boy now? And if Carl had said to the police, well, you know, this is my house and I have the right to refuse the use of my house if someone else is trying to use it, so I kicked him off the porch. It is obvious that Carl would be tried for murder. Here's the interesting thing about that story. Carl and Russell are not related. He's not like Russell's father or grandfather. They're not even friends at this point. But it still seems obvious that Carl has some sort of obligation to help Russell. I think that what happened here is that Carl has become Russell's guardian. Now, normally becoming a guardian is something you agree to. You're like, I will take care of this child now, and you like sign some paperwork or whatever. But that's not what happened here. I think that Carl became Russell's de facto guardian. In other words, because Carl was the only person in the immediate vicinity who was capable of caring for an inherently needy child, therefore he had to. I think there's absolutely a limit to what kinds of things Carl would need to provide for Russell. Like, I don't think Carl should be obligated to donate his kidney to Russell. I don't think Carl should be obligated to educate Russell. But I do think Carl minimally has to provide Russell with food and shelter until someone else can. And so I think a similar thing applies in pregnancy. I think you have an obligation to care for an inherently needy child when you are the only one who can. Again, if we could Star Trek beam into an artificial womb, that would be awesome, but we can't do that. And so if you are the only person capable of caring for an inherently needy child, then I think you have to. I think you can't kill them or kick them off your porch. The obligation to help approach has been very effective in many conversations that we've had about abortion. I think I've seen it change many minds, but conversations about bodily autonomy are like at its utmost importance in our society right now. And a lot of pro-choice people will point out that women's bodies are not houses. And I obviously agree with that. Pregnancy is different than the up story in a couple of ways, and maybe those ways are relevant. They would argue that Okay, sure, maybe you have to let Russell inside your house, but this is your body we're talking about. And you should never force people to use their bodies to support someone else. And so that brings me to what I think is the single most powerful refutation of bodily rights arguments. And that reveals a much more explicit problem with bodily autonomy arguments. That's the obligation to not kill people. I think that you never have the right to intentionally murder innocent babies. Like the problem with abortion is not that there's this vulnerable person who should be getting your help and they're not. The problem is that you're killing the baby. That's ultimately the issue with abortion. Now, I think basically what happens is that pro-choice people don't really understand what happens in an abortion. We have to know how exactly do abortions kill babies. This isn't comfortable to talk about. I don't like to think about what happens in an abortion. But I think in this case, the details do actually matter. So in the earliest stages of pregnancy, the woman ingests a drug to separate the embryo from the placenta, which is how he gets his oxygen. After he suffocates, she takes a second pill to cause cramping in the uterus to expel the now dead embryo. Once the embryo is too big for the woman to safely have a chemical abortion, then the abortion practitioner uses suction or forceps to dismember the fetus. If the fetus is too big for a dismemberment abortion, then he's first given a shot of digoxin to stop his heart, and then the woman gives birth to a dead baby. If someone killed a toddler by any of those methods, by suffocation, lethal injection, or dismemberment. No one would suggest that you were just not helping that toddler. Okay, those are lethal actions against a helpless, innocent person. Now, sometimes that feels unfair to pro-choice people because in pregnancy, we have this really weird scenario where I think you only have two options. You can either help that child by carrying it to term, or you can have the child killed through an abortion. Most other situations have three options. Like in most of the time, 
Let's say in kidney donation, you're dying of kidney failure, and I'm the only person in the whole world that can donate my kidney to you. I think I hypothetically have three options. I can either help you by donating my kidney to you, which would be super awesome, you wouldn't die, I'd be a good person, yay. I could not help you, which would be me not donating my kidney to you. You would die, very sad, but I shouldn't be get, like, legally in trouble for that. Or, hypothetically, I could kill you. Like, I could just come at you right now with a knife and kill you, maybe to save me from the embarrassment of having said no to you, okay? Hypothetically, I have all three of those options. In pregnancy, we only have two options. You can only help or kill. And I think this situation is much more rare, but it does exist sometimes, namely in the boat story. This is one of my favorite analogies. I tell it all the time when I talk to portrait people. Imagine that you have a boat, like an awesome yacht. Okay, it's huge. And you take it out into the middle of the ocean, and when you're out there, you discover that there is a toddler who has wandered onto your boat. Let's say that like, he was playing hide-and-go-seek at the docks with his siblings, and he wandered onto your boat, and he hid in a closet, and he promptly fell asleep, and then you took your boat out, and you don't discover this till you're in the middle of the ocean, that there is a, literally a toddler in your closet. I think you only have two options. I don't think this is like the kidney donation. I think all you have is help or kill. You can either help that child by allowing it to exist peacefully on your boat until you take the boat back to shore, and you can call law enforcement and they can come get the toddler, at which point I don't think you have to have any further obligation to that toddler. Or you can throw the toddler overboard, which would be killing it. There is no not help option. Like, if there was, that would be if we could Star Trek beam the toddler off of your boat and onto shore, and then you wouldn't have to deal with the toddler anymore and the toddler would be fine. But we cannot Star Trek beam people. And so I think if your only options are help or kill, you are obligated to not kill. And maybe it's really unfortunate that your only option left is help, but that's just the reality, folks. I think inherently the problem with abortion isn't that you're obligated to help. I think it's that you're obligated to not kill. Like, hypothetically, if my only two options were to either donate a pint of blood to a healthy but vulnerable person, or to kill that healthy but vulnerable person. Like, if there actually was no I refuse to help option, if it just comes down to help or kill, then I think you're obligated to donate that blood. It is not because I think you're generally obligated to help. It's because I think you may not kill innocent human beings. Now, sometimes this feels unfair to pro-choice people, because in the violinist thought experiment, you have this really easy out. You can just unplug from the violinist but that doesn't exist in pregnancy. So let's change the violinist thought experiment to make it more like actually pregnancy. Let's say that if you unplug from the violinist while he's alive, you're going to die. But if he's already dead, then you can safely unplug. Let's say you have a machete next to your bed. Can you hack the violinist to pieces in order to unplug? Absolutely not. Hey, the violinist thought experiment loses a lot of its rhetorical force as soon as it puts you in the position of someone who actually kills another person instead of just refusing to save them from their disease. Hey, there is this incredibly misleading thing about bodily rights arguments. They try to paint abortion as this mere withdrawing of support. Okay, but the unborn is not a terminally ill person that you're just like withdrawing life support from. Abortion is killing. Now, some pro-choice people and even some pro-life people think that certain kinds of abortion, mainly chemical abortion, RU486, is more justifiable because it's a less direct form of killing. It is true that it's a less direct form of killing, but that does not suddenly make it okay. Like, if I killed you by pounding you with my fist over and over again, or I killed you by hitting you with a rock, a rock is less, less direct than my fist. That does not suddenly make it okay. If I took off your scuba mask while you were at the bottom of the ocean floor, that would still be killing, but that'd be a lot less direct than killing you with a rock. Okay? Just because it's less direct doesn't suddenly make that okay. 
See, pro-choice bodily rights arguments always try to make this very convenient mistake of painting abortion as just not helping someone. They essentially try to say the unborn is this sick person. But that's not true. Now, if it's in thought experiment form, they always have a sick person stand in for the unborn, because it's the violinist is dying of kidney donation and he needs your kidney, or someone's dying of blood loss and they need your blood. This distinction, like healthy versus sick, does it actually matter? I think it definitely does. Because when a healthy person winds up dead in a medical thought experiment, is it because you just didn't save them? Like if at point A you have a healthy person, and at point B you have a dead person, and all that happened in between was a medical procedure, you can't say the surgeon just didn't save them. If at the beginning they were dying, and at the end they're dead, that might not be the surgeon's fault. Like that's a lot less clear. Maybe he just died and we couldn't save him. But if point A you have a healthy person and point B you have a dead person, that has to be on the surgeon. Okay, being sick matters. And the unborn are not terminally ill individuals. Abortion takes a life that is perfectly healthy, just underdeveloped and vulnerable, and intentionally snuffs it out. Now, some pro-choice people might say, ha, well, fine, you, you admitted that it's underdeveloped. That's the same thing as being sick. Being underdeveloped and vulnerable is not the same thing as being sick. We all know this. A newborn is too underdeveloped and vulnerable to swim. And so if you took a newborn out of its crib and dropped it in a pool, you cannot say that it's just not helping it. It was too underdeveloped to survive in that environment because its lungs weren't developed enough to be able to like hold its breath and actually swim and all of those things. And so being underdeveloped does not mean you get to just take someone out of that environment in which they are growing and drop them somewhere where you know they can't survive. That's exactly what happens in a chemical abortion. It's suffocation. It's taking someone out of an environment where they are vulnerable and growing and putting them in an environment where you know they can't survive because they're not gonna be able to breathe in that environment. It's the same thing as dropping a newborn in the ocean. Okay, being underdeveloped and vulnerable is not the same thing as being sick. I am not arguing that we always have an obligation to help innocent and vulnerable people. What I am arguing is that strong people always have an obligation to not kill innocent and vulnerable people. Last thing, this distinction between killing someone and letting them die, like in what cases is that actually morally relevant? I get that there are some like trolley cases where this can be really confusing, but other cases are not confusing, which is why I bring up blood donation. Blood donation is really helpful to distinguish from abortion because if you're dying of blood loss and I don't donate blood to save you, I am not a killer. You died from some sort of injury. You died from blood loss. You died from a disease, whatever that was. And I just chose not to save you from that. But if I took an ax and I dismembered you, then I'm a killer. If I lethally injected you, I am a killer. If I took away your oxygen tank while you're at the ocean floor, I am a killer. There is no way around it. Abortion is killing. And the doctors that perform abortions are killers. I understand that there are emotionally justifiable reasons to want to paint abortion as something other than killing. But I don't think that's helping anyone. I don't think it's helpful to pretend that abortion is something other than what it is. I think that the only way we're gonna end abortion is to acknowledge what it is. And then to get the men and women who have participated in it the support that they need to heal from that. Thank you very much. about six, seven minutes for questions. If anyone has anything, they would like to raise their hand. I think there are some note cards available in the back. If you would rather write down a question, you're welcome to do that. Otherwise, I am happy to take raised hands. No one has a question. Wow. Yes, in the back. What if you're standing in a machine with buttons, and sets, knowing in your mind that you can't be pregnant because you are on birth control and you have to do any and you never be pregnant. But this one, you do Sure. So in that, in that machine, I love to imagine that there are multiple buttons there. 
that each correspond to different kinds of birth control. And so we could have a button that has a super, super small percent chance. There is no birth control that has a 0% chance that you're going to get pregnant, like actually zero, unless you literally like cut your tubes. That's the only way that's going to work. You've like removed everything. That, 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 that's fine. That's not really birth control. That, that's something else entirely. But if you're like taking a pill or whatever that is, you've had some sort of procedure that's not literally preventing conception entirely by cutting something, then there is always a percent chance, 0.00001 percent chance that you are going to actually get pregnant. And so that could be one of the buttons up here. And so you are always rolling the dice you know that it's possible, hypothetically. And so you can choose, and you can choose the button that has the really, really low percentage. You're welcome to do that. But you know that a newborn still could pop out. And so I think in that scenario, one of the reasons that I use a man comes up and I say that he deliberately doesn't want a newborn to come out, so he picks one of the lower percent chance buttons, he still has an obligation to care for that child if it does pop out. Like, it's really unfortunate. I'm, I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't go the way you wanted, but you push the button. You still rolled the dice. There is always a chance. And so I think it still matters that you are willingly engaged in action which you know might result. And you're trying to take actions to prevent it, but you still know it might happen. So I think the responsibility objection still covers cases of, of birth control, things like that. Yes, question next. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for making this um, not be totally Christian-based. Because um, I've often approached things that way, mm -hmm. and then it falls flat and goes nowhere because yeah. then they say you Christians are all the same. I was trying to do this. So, but it was really excellent the way you laid this out, and I appreciate that. And I feel like kind of falling out with my granddaughter, who uh, is just all for uh, abortion. And is there some way I can heal that? Some way I can mend that, go back to her? Sure. So, um, let me address the first point you made quickly. So ERI does not have any religious content. That's something that we are very passionate about. I am happy to go talk about religion when I'm doing an outreach and I'm talking to a pro-choice person. If they want to talk about it, I am more than happy to go there. But let me tell you, they are always way more interested in my views on Christianity after they have heard all my views about abortion. And they've heard me make all these secular arguments. Then they're fascinated. Like, I have hooked them. And so I am more than happy to go talk about religion, but it is never my first move. And you will never see a single argument we teach at ERI that is religiously based. They are all secular arguments. And we think that's really important. So I'm glad that, that people also are seeing the value of that. In terms of helping people to heal relationships with pro-choice people in their lives, when there have maybe been some not great conversations. We've all been there. We've all had a really negative conversation about abortion with someone at some point. And some of us are in a situation where that's a person that's really close to us. And it's just really hard to have those conversations. So I think the most important thing that you can do to try to really help a pro-choice person is to get to know them and where they're coming from. Like, I've had plenty of conversations with pro-choice people who were very angry about this issue and did not want to talk to me about it. And I will spend, like, the first 30 minutes, or the first whole conversation, if there's more than one conversation, just listening to them, just trying to understand where they're coming from, what they think about this issue. I'll ask them tons of clarification questions, not leading questions, not questions that, like, sound like I'm trying to make them go somewhere. Just honest, help me understand where you're coming from and what's driving your view. And that inevitably brings their walls down after I do that for a while, because they realize that I'm actually interested in understanding them. I'm actually open-minded about this. And if it turns out that I'm wrong and you're right, I'm, I'm gonna change my mind. I really wanna understand you, I love you, I care for you and what you think. They start to become way more interested in what my arguments are. The next thing I'll always do when I go to actually make a pro-life argument, which if it's somebody really close to you, I don't even recommend you do that in the first conversation. I, this is going to be a series. People don't change their mind in singular conversations. People change their mind like I think water changes rock formations. It's very slowly over time just repeated going over the same material. That's how someone changes their mind. And so loving them and listening to them. And finally, when you get to the point of making arguments, I am going to make my argument. And then I'm going to say, what do you think about that? 
I am not going to ask obnoxious leading questions. I am not going to like have this awkward body language where I feel really defensive about my view. I'm just going to be super transparent. Be like, this is what's going on for me. This is what I think. This is why what you said doesn't totally make sense to me. Help me understand. Like, uh, what do you think about that? Come back at me here. I want to create an environment where we're on the same team. We're trying to find truth together. We're not debating. That's not the point. The point is two friends sitting down over coffee who can just have an honest conversation and try to love each other and understand each other. I think ultimately that's how you get someone's defenses down so that they can ultimately hear what you have to say. It comes through loving them and not being defensive yourself, being open to hearing what they have to say. I am out of time, very sadly, but I am more than happy to take more questions, talk to you all. I am not scary, I promise. Feel free to come up and talk to me. I also have a booth out there that I'll go to as soon as people are done talking to me here. Thank you so much for coming in. I appreciate it. <laughs>